be you, Heidi. So yeah, so as I'm getting my sharing set up, there we go. All right, so my name is Heidi Robbie, and I'm a speech language pathologist and really excited to talk to you today about assistive technology coaching models. Um, and there's a QR code again for <laughs> the handout. So lots of options to get the handouts. And there's also a bit.ly link that we put in the chat as well. Um, so again, I also want to go over my financial disclosures. Um, some of the work that is depicted or that I talk about in my presentation may be from consulting fees or independent contractor work. I'm not being paid to do this presentation, um, but the work that I am the work I talk about, I do get paid for. Um, so non-financial relationships, I'm administrator of the Facebook group, Illinois AAC and co-developer of the AAC Community Center in, in Illinois. Um, I'm also a member of a variety of professional social media groups and ASHA Division 12 and 14. Your handouts will say 18, I switched this year, from the telepractice to the cultural and linguist, linguistic diversity. Um, so yeah, a little bit about me, like I said, I'm a speech language pathologist and specialize in AAC and have also worn the hat of assistive technology specialist for a small school district in the area. I live in the Chicago area and have always worked with children and adults with developmental disabilities from my first year out of grad school to today. So, and I've worked in a variety of settings. I spent a total of 13 years working for school districts in the course of a couple different stints. I worked in Ireland for three years and started my private practice, Authentic Expression LLC in 2016 um, to really help families be able to implement and support people, who, their kids who use AAC originally in the home environment. And I've since expanded to now having clinic and teletherapy sessions because, well, COVID pandemic <laughs> pushed me into teletherapy and I love it. Um, you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and my email address is there as well. Um, to help kind of guide me a little bit, love to know a little bit about you guys. Um, so if you want to throw in the chat like what your role is and just to help me know how many speech paths there are, how many OTs, PTs, parents. Um, and I will watch the chat. And I am pretty participatory. So there are times that I will also ask questions. Awesome. And then there will be the awkward silence. Ooh, yay, SLPs, OTs, SLPAs, ooh, consultant for birth to five, ooh, EIPT, AAC, SLP, yay. Another AAC parent. Another birth to three, AAC, SLP. Ooh, a couple more PTs. I'm ex really excited to have PTs. Another teletherapist, SLP. Okay, you can keep coming in if you want to. Another OT. So by the end of our time today, I'm hoping that you'll be able to describe the differences between relationship-driven, stakeholder-centered, and client-centered coaching, and that you will identify some new coaching techniques to support your current caseload or workload um, or other teams that you support. Um, one of the motivations of talking about coaching and um, is I've realized that there are a lot of definitions of a coach that when people say coach or coach them through this, people are meaning different things. And then it gets like the, the waters get muddied when we're, all, when we're talking about, when we're using the same words with different meanings. So I found it helpful to think about what is a coach? And I've, and I've asked this question of my friends, of you know, a pretty nice sampling. If you want to hit the QR code, 
Um, you can also contribute to your ideas of what is a coach or the answer garden is here and I will stick that in the chat as well. And I just keep, every time I talk about coaching I just keep adding on to this one. So we have a nice mix there. So when you hear the word coach, what do you think of? So, and these have been some of the answers. And I'll refresh a couple times. So as you can as you can see, you know, because it's a word. Um, ooh, someone said sports. So yes. Um, so as you can see, there are many ideas of when you hear the word coach, what do we think of? So yes, many of us think of sports or a trainer, and that's originally what I had in my head too, and was thinking, and what I would think of is like the, the typical, you know, at like athletic trainer kind of giving you commands and telling you what to do, which is interesting to me that guide, support, and mentor are one of the biggest and most common responses. But, you know, there's also the horse-drawn carriage. My personal favorite is the part of the airplane most of us sit in, um, or the fancy purse. So, <laughs> Um, I also find it interesting that many people have responded that it's difficult, that they think difficult, partner, someone guiding, that they're supportive, they're a cheerleader and a helper. So there are a lot of different thoughts about what a coach is. So for our time today, we're going to be talking about what a coach is and what a coach isn't, and then the different models. Um, so this you, if you have, if you downloaded the PDF version, you may not have this in your handout because I added it last week um, as I just got this information. Um, and it's from Diane Sweeney and she is a leading educational coach and researcher. And this is specifically about what coaching is and isn't and specifically student-centered coaching because some of the, the coaching is a partnership. We're focused on student and I would say stakeholder learning. And to me, a stakeholder is anyone who is invested in either the person who is using AAC, a, stu a student or whoever is at the center of our work is and then everyone who's invested in that work is a stakeholder. Um, it's good for the students. Um, the outcomes are standards-based and we're driven by the teacher's goals. So there I would replace that with stakeholder goals. And we're flexible and responsive and fun and interesting. It's not evaluative. When I started with coaching, it, I'll be honest that administrators wanted some evaluation of the teachers. And that was one of the most difficult aspects of shifting into student-centered coaching for me when I worked for the school districts because the administrators wanted feedback on the teacher or the SLP performance. And that really isn't the role of a coach. Um, they're not focused on making teachers do things or fixing teachers because coaches believe that everyone is fully capable and approach work from a belief that everyone is doing the best they can and everyone can learn and we all can learn to do better and that we're all constantly evolving and learning. So it's really approaching your work from a place of wonder because good coaches are curious, we're reflective and really think about our own practices as well and are modeling that. We're listening to what the stakeholders are saying and not coming in with our own agendas, which may automatically makes us collaborative and really supporting and celebrating the success of others. Um, and we're meeting others where they are. The same as we meet our students where they are, we meet the stakeholders and the adults where they are too. And it's very important to be authentic because we all know when someone is being fake with us or humoring us, we know it. So, and I find sharing joy in even small, what others see as, or themselves see as small successes, sharing those joys and having that reciprocity really helps build that coaching relationship. 
it also fills my bucket when other people are excited at success, you know, and not teaching them to not minimize success, as you'll see later. I have the image of, this is actually one of the Hawaiian islands um, that I took on vacation, but I have the image of an island here because, and you'll hear this more in, the, in a video um, of a coaching session, I view my role as island surfing. So, and I heard this in the training and it really resonated with me of that as coaches, we need to go to the person or the stakeholders where they are and meet them with where they are and leave our own baggage behind. So we're constantly island surfing, which I also just like the imagery of that and wish I could island surf in the Caribbean right now or any or the Pacific or anywhere warm. Um, but we're island surfing to their island and joining them and really doing the work the stakeholders are, are interested in doing. It's hard, it's a change and change can be hard, but it's also very rewarding. Um, another thing kind of as a foundational knowledge that has helped me is this is the trans theoretical model of change. And it was originally developed out of addiction, um, but it has been applied in other places, um, primarily in psychotherapy. But I have found it very helpful for me to reframe and use this model to reframe when I'm getting what I feel is resistance. So I'm working with a team right now who, and one of my individual clients, the student gets very dysregulated and I see it as dysregulation and other, the team is seeing it as willful behavior. So we're trying to work through how we can create a shared understanding of what's going on and what's happening with this child and why they're not doing well and why they're not meeting expectations at school. So I'm trying to reframe the frustration of, okay, they're in pre-contemplation of, they're not aware, and like we have different views of things. They don't want to change their view. I don't want to change my view. So I guess we're both in pre-contemplation. So in the contemplation stage, you're realizing something needs to change. Something isn't working, but I don't quite know what it is. And you're figuring out what that is. In committing to action, you're developing your plan of, okay, I figured out what I want to change and I'm developing a plan to do it. And then in action, you're actually doing the plan, you're modifying it, you're seeing how it feels. That's where a lot of the discomfort of growth is, is that in that action stage and the commitment to action as well of that sometimes trying something new and growing can feel really uncomfortable. But if we get through that, we then get into maintenance and it becomes a habit. And the termination isn't like we don't stop doing the behavior. We are, it's then a habit. So we don't have to think about it. And then we repeat as we want to change new behaviors or new thinking. So which leads us into now that we have a very brief <laughs> overview of kind of some of my kind of philosophical ways that I'm approaching coaching is the three main models, um, the relationship-driven, stakeholder-centered, and client-centered. And we're going to start with relationship-driven, which I think is what most of us tend to originally think about with coaching. So in relationship-driven coaching, the coach provides support and resources to the stakeholders. The focus is on providing support in a way that doesn't challenge or threaten the stakeholder. So a teacher may come to you to say, hey, how do I program this? Or I um, support a, have supported a student for a couple of years and now he has a new SLP at his school and that school SLP just wanted to know, like she feels comfortable with AAC. So as a consultant, they don't need my support as much and want to know, okay, how do I do this programming? And she reaches out as she has questions. So, and tries 
and looks for resources. So I'm getting them connected with an AAC mentor. So an adult who can talk to the junior high student about some of his challenges using AAC. So I'm seen as the friendly resource to connect them with other resources. And that's really the heart of relationship-driven coaching. Um, so like I said, so you may be training people on how to program an AAC system or an assistive technology tool when the stakeholder asks you to. So it's usually them coming to you and asking or you doing a check-in of like, hey, how's this going? Do you need anything? Um, giving literature on modeling or aided language stimulation um, or any other aspect of AAC or assistive technology, sharing videos, how to teaching them how to physically operate the tool. Like a lot of times that's where people want to start. And it's important to know how to operate, like how to the operational competency and how to actually use it. But the language piece in AAC is, I find, a, a much more challenging piece in sending how-to videos for programming or tools. So the advantages of this model is that it builds your relationship and it builds trust. So oftentimes, this is where I will start um, to really, and it's comfortable and unexpected relationship with a consult with an outside consultant or a coach, especially someone who doesn't have a lot of experience being the recipient of coaching. Um, it supports learning and it meets the expectations of the stakeholders and it help you can use that to help them become more curious and wanting to learn more. So you can use it to help them support further learning. However, it often doesn't translate into using new skills or change their behavior very much. So the research is pretty clear that when you just give resources or teach a skill as a once-off training, so unfortunately something like this, um, often doesn't translate into a much change of actual practice. I have chosen to reframe that as thinking of planting seeds that later will grow. And that may take two, three, four, five years, but it does happen, but it doesn't happen as quickly in relationship-driven coaching. So any questions on that? I'm kind of cruising through. And is that a model that you all are familiar with or feel comfortable with? Heidi, I, this is Gail. I I love the way you've um, framed these three types of coaching and um, and the fact that you, you identify uh, relationship centered coaching as as planting seeds. So um, thank you for that. It, th there's lots of different models of this, but this one is really resonating with me. Thank you. It doesn't look like we have any questions. So I will stop the awkward pausing um, and move into stakeholder-centered coaching. And this one also, at least in my area, has become more common. Um, we went through the Chicago area, at least the sub northern suburbs where I work, went through a period where there were coaches for everything. Um, and overwhelmed teachers and now it's backing off to being a little bit more strategic in it. And stakeholder center coaching, the focus is to change the stakeholder behavior through coaching. So more through in coaching being more synonymous with teaching. So the use of the tools or the system, again, is the primary objective of the coaching. And the coach is there to hold the person accountable for their instructional practices. So more similar to like what I first experienced when I was working in the schools that was supposed to be student-centered coaching, but administration may ask for feedback or the coach then set, like gives a word of the week and may ask for data sheets from the team. Um, the coach may be a collaborator providing problem solving and action planning, but it's usually the coach who 
is developing the plan with collaboration from the team. So the coach is the trainer or the teacher. And I think this is more, you know, as I saw with some of the responses in the answer garden, this is more of what we often think about when we hear the word coach. So the agenda and the learning targets come from someone other than the person being coached. So other than the stakeholder, they may come from, if you're in a school, they may come from administration or in a medical a medical setting, they may come from it from administration again. Um, they may come from you yourself uh, or someone other than the person than the stakeholder or stakeholders that you are supporting. And because of that, the stakeholders don't feel as much autonomy in their learning. And adult learners, I think all learners want to have autonomy in their learning. And we're more invested when we're engaged. Um, principles of UDL, Universal Design for Learning apply for adults too, that when we can engage and, and have, we as adults, when we're seeking out the information, we're going to be more engaged and want to do what we're learning. Um, so staff may be treating the, you know, so staff may be using a core word of the week, which is a very common strategy in AAC in teaching the staff how to use, you know, like how to access that and give ideas of like, okay, here's where you can use that. Here's, here are times you can model that word. Um, they may collect data on the staff use in the AAC system. So sometimes going in and observing and collecting data. Um, they may be giving feedback on their use of aided language stimulation or they may, or demonstration. And I use the term stimulation and demonstration, I use demonstration instead of modeling as an aside because demonstration, you're showing the person, but you're not expecting an immediate model. Whereas I find that AAC is the only place in the speech therapy world and education where modeling means demonstration. So even in like in our tech therapy for SLPs, when we're giving a model, we're expecting the student or client to do something back. But modeling without expectation in AAC is demonstration. So we're showing. So again, to in an effort to be more clear in vocabulary, I use the term demonstration. Um, I also switched because I observed an interaction with an ABA therapist and a parent and I was doing home-based therapy. So I was there and the ABA therapist was talking about modeling and the parent was talking about modeling on the, on the device. And I realized through this interaction that the parent meant demonstration and modeling, just using it for their own messages. And the ABA therapist was saying that the modeling wasn't working because the student or the client wasn't imitating back. So it, after a couple minutes of this, observing this, I realized, wait, you two have different definitions. So we came up with a different term there for that team to use as well. Um, so I have shifted away from the term modeling kind of as an aside. And if you have, if you have, have yourself have found that different teams have confusion over that term, that may be part of why. Um, so in stakeholder center coaching, they also may teach the stakeholders a prescribed implementation program and give feedback on their use. So when you're doing stakeholder centered coaching, you acknowledge the stakeholders expertise and really guide mutual problem solving and ask, still want to ask, how can we develop a plan for whatever you're working on and guiding mutual action planning. So again, this is shifting from the stakeholder as the holder of knowledge into a little bit more in the student, the client stakeholder centered model where everyone has information and knowledge that should be brought to the table and shared. The guiding mutual action planning, because that's how we will get follow through. That if everyone at the table agrees on the action plan, and something that I've learned from implementation science is you want them to verbally agree because then they're more likely to do what they say they're going to do. 
um, because you feel guilt when you have said that you're, you've committed to something and committed to action and then not do it. Um, and be trustworthy. So again, if administration is asking you, how did they do on this? Figuring out how to navigate that water of what is said in coaching stays in coaching. Um, and really praising success that, and even if it feels like a really small success, it's still success and that snowballs because success builds success. And we're trying to break down skills that are really difficult. And for us, sometimes we forget how, like where we started and what that knowledge horizon is. Mm -hmm. So we want to really be praising their success and help building mutual understanding and action planning and being respectful and collegial and use reflective listening and asking good questions. Because another thing that I have found often in coaching and actually attended a two or three day workshop on this back when I worked in the schools, <laughs> just re re reflective listening and asking good questions. Because we keep, there's a pattern that we, so if someone asks us a question, we give them an answer or a solution, and then we get the same question back, and we get frustrated that they're asking again when you've already given them the solution, where really what's going on is what they're asking isn't necessarily what they're asking for. So we need to, especially in situations where that happens, we need to be asking more questions and trying to listen to what they're really asking for. So if they're frustrated that, say, a device is too complex for a student, asking more questions about what does that look like? What, what is, you know, questions for clarification, what does that look like to you? Why do you think that this is too complex? What's happening? there that's making that what do you think is happening to making it complex and then looking at the reasons and their evidence so have you you know ask i will ask teams have you collected data on this what data do we need what will what will help us guide decision making um especially school you know schools really want and need evidence-based decision making so what student evidence do we have and then also looking at what are their viewpoints, especially for that example of a system being too complex. Oftentimes I have found it's complex and overwhelming for the adults or the adults don't know what competent use and finished looks like. And I've also been spending a lot of time learning about executive functioning lately. Um, because many of my clients have executive functioning challenges, but it really comes into work, into play, into coaching too, that if we don't know what finished looks like, how do we know what we're working towards? And many people just in general don't know what competent AAC use looks like, because it can look like a lot of different things. And I think at least for my, the families I've supported and the teams I've supported, their vision has been that communication will be as fast as a speaking person's communication. And, but the reality in AAC is it never will be because speech is our finest motor movement. Our fingers just can't, our eyes can't move that fast. And the technology right now can't move that fast. So looking and seeing, okay, what is, you know, what are their viewpoints? What are their perspectives? And really peeling away at, that information and that kind of and some of those thoughts to see if some of that is is if they have expectations of success that may not be realistic for this person and also reminding teams that it takes a speaking child five to six years to master language like their language system is competent by five, six years. So similarly, we would expect at least that, if not longer, for someone using AAC. 
So if we're doing a four week trial and they find words and are using it for communication, that's amazing. Like that's really good success, but people seem to think that, oh, they'll just pick it up. And that's not how, as we know, as an AC therapist, that's not how it happens. Um, so really, and then if we're looking at those viewpoints and those perspectives, asking questions that really probe the implications and consequences of some of those views or even some of that evidence and asking questions about the question. And that's the one that I find most helpful sometimes when I keep getting the same question back, that I'm really, I like to ask the why of the why whenever I'm looking at working with teams of, so why are they so, you know, if they're not using their device the way a team thinks they should be, why? So why are they choosing behavior instead of symbolic communication? Why do we think that is? And keep peeling away because then we start to get into more authentic problem solving and that's where we get success rather than that surface level. It does take time and takes us as coaches asking, knowing what questions to ask and building that relationship. And I realize in a consultative model, sometimes you only have one interaction. So the, but the more that we can ask some of these questions, and by the way, these are Socratic questions. Um, the more we can ask better questions, the better use we can use of our time that we have. Um, so some examples of stakeholder center coaching, um, Center and BOD have an eight step instructional model to train school staff in partner augmented input. Um, that is a evidence-based model, and, but their research was, was taking data on what the stakeholders did rather than student outcomes. I think they're now following up with student outcomes, um, but initially it's training the partners and all of the focus is on the partners. Ogletree back in 2012 also did research on stakeholders as partners to make AAC work better. And again, that focuses on the partners. Um, many of the interve early intervention coaching models are focused on parent training. Um, and many of the part, obviously partner strategies that we teach in AAC are all stakeholder centered. So, in, in a good stakeholder centered co coaching relationship, we can build a lot of trust between the, the coach and the stakeholder, especially when you are having a longer term relationship. So like if this, if you're the SLP and you're, this is your classroom team and it does change behavior, stakeholder behavior, which is a place to start. You've planted the seed and now it's growing a little bit and you're increasing knowledge and knowledge is the first step. If you're thinking back to that trans theoretical model, increasing knowledge then supports getting into contemplation stage and action if we're trying to change behavior and thoughts or beliefs about people who may have complex communication needs. And it can have a, a positive impact on the student to client performance. The main con for me um, is that the stakeholders may not understand the why. So I think it's Carolyn Musselwhite has a visual often, often talks about vocabulary falling from the sky for AAC users that like you are doing vocabulary, you know, like you're doing a lesson, you bring in some vocabulary words and then you take them away. So like they're falling from the sky. Similarly, stakeholders under coaching, if you're not teaching the adults the why, it feels like things are falling from the sky. So they may not initiate or have, so they don't have as much autonomy, so they may not have as much stake in it. So you may not see as much change as you're hoping for. And the focus is on the teaching practices and not the student or client outcomes. So the assumption is that by changing teaching practices, student and client outcomes will change, which I do find happens, but the focus is still on the teacher and or the stakeholder outcome or stakeholder practices. And so that may not result in as long-term change. So you may be staying in that action phase, but not get to that maintenance phase of the model. 
All right. So I'm going to stop talking and show you what this looks like. Um, so this video is actually of our first coaching session. I'm currently collaborating and coaching my employee. So there's my employee and then another practice in the area wants to build their SLPs skills in AAC. So we are teaming together and moving towards client-centered um, and stakeholder-centered coaching. Uh, or sorry, client-centered coaching. And then, sorry, this is actually relationships. So, no, yes, sorry. <laughs> um, as we're moving towards client-centered, our first sessions were more building that relationship. So this interaction is more stakeholder-centered coaching. Let's see. And we are kind of introducing ourselves. And I said it's really group. Is that uh, it? Uh, all right. So in here, you'll see we're all SLPs. And this is our first session together. So I'm talking a little bit what, about what I'm hoping the group will be from. And then they had introduced themselves. So we cut all of that out. And then we jump into a problem solving. And I'll be pausing it throughout to talk a little bit more and highlight a few of the techniques. It supports your needs and your professional practice and really bringing in reflection and supporting each other and kind of turning this into or supporting this to develop a professional learning community where we can come together and be like, hey, I have this client. How would you do this? And like really brainstorming together. I and that's the goal of client center coaching. Understand the expert model. I do not embrace the expert model um, because we all have and I'm highlighting that because in the introductions, each of them emphasized that they were excited for my expertise, which makes me personally, I don't like, like I said, I don't like the expert model and being viewed as an expert because everyone has expertise. Shared experiences that are really valuable for helping each other. So that's kind of what I was thinking, does that seem like on track with what you guys were hoping or thoughts? I think that'll be so helpful for us. Left. Do you guys have any burning questions or anything you want to kind of dive into to start with? Or any, or set like priorities for next month? Mm. So I can have some stuff prepared for you and then we can talk about it. So again, having th me having things prepared is more of the stakeholder center. I have a specific kid question, if that's okay. Absolutely. I have, for the first time, a kid who's like totally independent on his device. Awesome. Um, but it's like very much so impeding his behavior because he his brain won't be with the group, but instead on his device. So we've gone through social stories, we've gone through like having expectations on our desk, and I want him to know like that is your voice, that's totally fine, but all of our peers are stopping and waiting and listening, um, and it's just not working out, and he's not getting the most out of his education because he will just find something that he would like to talk about, but it's not the right moment. And right now, because of my schedule, I'm not able to sit down and do like a full training, but instead every week I give them like one thing that they're supposed to either look more into on a student's device um, or just like a tip of the week, pretty much. So those are stakeholder centered approaches. Are they things, are they at the point yet where they're asking you questions or for information? Um, Like two out of the four. So then, so what I will frequently do then is instead of doing, I guess I should also ask, are they following through on your tip of the week and what you're asking them to follow up on? Those two out of the four are. So and those are the paraprofessionals. Start with the ones who are interested and want to learn because that success will breed success. Yes. So, and then maybe, so then asking, I try to ask them what they're interested in and kind of a visual that I learned 
in some of my coaching trainings that I carry with me is joining their islands, like your island surfing. Okay. Oftentimes, at least I have found in AAC, what they're asking and what I would do to start with are not the same thing. So letting go of that, no, that's not where I would start. Mm -hmm. But if they're asking and want to try something, you know, being curious, like, oh, what, you know, tell me more about it. What, you know, what is your goal here? And just talking a little bit more about what their thinking is so that then you can build in a little bit of that praxis. And it's something that they're already motivated to either problem they're motivated to solve or something they want to learn more. Okay. You're sneaking that in and then they're going to learn more and get more excited. And then <laughs> it snowballs. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I can definitely do that. So thank you. So there I'm explaining the technique and I'm doing more of the talking or you'll see in the client centered, I do less of the talking. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to island surf, though. <laughs> like, at least it is for me, because I'm like, <laughs> as long as it's not something that I view as harmful, so, you know, like, mm -hmm. like taking away the device, yeah. Right, yeah, thank I, you I for advocating. <laughs> but the team, what I cut out was the team wanted to take, up, take away the device as one of the solutions of, and that it was causing her students device use was causing frustration and physical aggression in other students. So it was a safety issue that we were problem solving. Asking them, why do you want to take it away? And just peeling away at that. Yes. Why of the why. Thank you. That's, that's awesome. Right, so that is some stakeholder centered ah, coaching. And as you saw, so there I was talking more, we are problem solving but I was trying to ask some of those probing questions to get a little bit more information. And for brevity, what I cut out there was asking more questions about the classroom setup and how the teachers were approaching things. And, and as you saw, who was interested, who was invested in starting there. So there's a little bit more advice given, which is why I would consider that more of the stakeholder center. Any questions on stakeholder centered before we spend the rest of our time diving into client centered, which I think is the more challenging and less common. I don't see any I'm looking at time. So in client centered coaching, the stakeholders are driving the agenda. So they're the ones bringing the question. So there she brought the question. So it's the beginning of client-centered coaching, but then the, the coach is seen more as kind of a guide and asking those questions to help the person being coached come up with their own answers. Um, so true partnership is formed you, and you're, you're focusing on improving the, st the student or client outcomes. So the following month when we met, I followed up to ask like, what has changed and how did student behavior change? So not just how did it feel, but how did this impact the students? So you're putting your students or your clients at the center, even when they're not there. Um, so the technology and the tools and are seen as a tool to move your student or your client forward and to help them have success. And as I've alluded to, stakeholders are seen as skilled and valuable. So they're seen as an important part of the process and really the central part of the process that we are here to guide them and help them. And so there's often in student-centered coaching, there are coaching cycles. So the cycle that I'm in, right? And cycles can take a varying amount of time. Usually they're four to six sessions, four to six sessions long. Um, but you can use some of the techniques if you don't have that amount of time. Um, so you're using the principles of partnership and you're going through cycles and they're very non-prescriptive. And the coach is supporting critical thinking and decision making by the team. So you're planning, you may be observing. So this is a traditional coaching cycle. 
you're developing your action and your practice collaboratively. You're the, t- the person who you're coaching is providing reflection and or you're reflecting together and giving feedback. And oftentimes the planning can be done over email, the observation can be done either through video or um, in person. And often the action, observation and action and practice are together and your reflection and feedback are together just because time is usually of the essence and very short when you're a consultant or a coach um, and teachers are busy and teams are busy. Um, So, but when looking at coaching, you're really working from the principles of partnership. And I view it more now as kind of a way of thinking and approaching work rather than the stricter coaching cycles, because I don't always have that ongoing relationship with some of the teams. It may be a one or two inter- time er- interaction. Um, and Jim Knight is an educational coach and researcher on educational coaching. Um, and his book, Unmistakable Impact, came, um, really focused and kind of did the research on what are the key principles of partnership, which is the foundation of coaching. And he found that equality, choice, voice, dialogue, reflection, praxis, and reciprocity are key to coaching. So everyone is equal, that you're not just a TA, you're not just a parent. There is no just. Everyone is equal and has different information to bring to the table everyone has a choice and everyone has a say. So going around the, you know, if you're at a team meeting, asking and inviting input from everyone and having dialogue and practicing that reflective listening and the praxis sometimes we're bringing in additional information. So right, this hopefully is some praxis for everyone of bringing in some new information to then be able to start integrating so that everyone has a shared foundation of each other's information and each other's experiences and reciprocity that you're really sharing that joy and you're looking for a two-way relationship and celebrating that. Um, Sweeney, who I'd already mentioned as as another educational coaching um, researcher and clinician, So she says the core practices of client-centered coaching are using coaching cycles. And again, this is not for assistive technology. I've borrowed it into assistive technology and AAC that, but you're still setting standards-based goals. So there's still goals that you're working towards and you're unpacking the learning targets and co-planning with student or client evidence. You may be co-treating but really everything comes back to the impact on the student and the teacher learning and that you're partnering with the school administration. So some examples of this are the Hannon more than words. So there's cognitive coaching, reflexive coaching. I've already mentioned Jim Knight and Diane Sweeney's models and they have websites for information and books. Um, And then just non-standardized or non-packaged coaching and following the principles, which is more of what I do and learning more from different sources and integrating it. So some of the advantages is that there's no judgment that the coach you know, isn't judging, isn't um, bringing their own agenda and the stakeholders are really bringing the goals. So the stakeholders are invested and motivated and because it's non-formulaic, everyone gets to come up with their own solutions. And as you saw in the video, the solutions that teams come up with aren't quite often are not the solutions I would have thought of, but that's okay. Every team needs to start with their own in their own place. And I don't have all the answers and my answers and my thought may not work for the team for reasons that I'm not aware of um, or my own biases. So the teams are coming up with and the stakeholders are coming up with their own solutions. So they are more invested and they're, and they are then able to better support the client's learning. And all learning is celebrated by the stakeholders and from the, on behalf of the client and the coach. And they understand why they're doing what they're doing. So they know that why and that why of the why. 
and they're learning current practices and the coaches are supporting adult learners and, and the adult learning and folk keep by keeping it centered on the student or the client. Um, I have found it, it can be very difficult to get buy-in at the start of this because it is a different way of working than we have been used to. So, you know, going back to that trans theoretical model, many people are in the pre-contemplation to contemplation stage of, especially the contemplation stage of, I know this isn't quite working, but change is uncomfortable. I'm not sure that we can change the system. So we may need to start with relationship driven or, or teacher centered to get that relationship and make some of those changes more gradually, which on the part of coaches can be frustrating because change can take a long time. Um, it requires a different set of skills from the coach. So it requires us to really look outside of our own profession for information as well, no matter what our profession is, unless you're in implementation science, but even then you're looking at research and information from education and educational coaching and implementation science and psychology. So you have to, us as coaches have to be willing and curious to be looking outside of our own profession as well for information to really help hone our skills and help us continue to develop. And the stakeholders may have goals that are different than good or best practice. And that's really where it can be challenging. And that's where those asking questions and really peeling back some of those assumptions and figuring out the priorities of the staff can be really helpful because there's usually a reason why they want to do something that we've learned is not best or good, maybe good practice. And rather than just saying, getting pressure and saying, no, this isn't, <laughs> it's because it's not good practice, but really peeling back and helping them understand and see the long term of, of what they may want to be doing or why it's not. Or sometimes, depending on what it is, if again, if there's not harm to the student or the client, I will have teams try something that I think may not be in the long term best interest, but they need to experience it. And then they'll come back and say like, oh, OK, now we're seeing this and then we can start to problem solve it rather than. And that's where, you know, like that needs to build that trust and they need to have that investment. But it's a very fine balance because we don't want them to get too frustrated and give up. So also knowing your team's frustration tolerance. So I you know I could spend the rest of our time doing a couple case examples. I will go over this one quickly because I have another video as well. And I also want to say there are a lot of resources at the end of the presentation because I like to know where um, presenters information is from and just so there's a lot after the questions um, section, if you want to peruse on your own learning. Um, so this is one of my individual clients. Um, and at the beginning of the pandemic, we switched to, so in, you know, like March, 2020, we switched to teletherapy and the mom made sure that the mom was there. And I have to say mom is a middle school English teacher. So her son learning to write is really important for her. And she started getting some of the grade level material and trying, we were working on trying to adapt it. Um, so she wanted to know how he could be writing more. And he is a two switch scanner. Um, so, and he had no experience with writing pre pandemic. So pre 2020, he, his experience with writing was dictating to me and I would physically write it. Um, so we met and spent about an hour talking about what her goals were and created a table of where, of all of the emergent and liter, like a whole list of literacy skills, where we thought his skills were, because they had never been assessed. And he was finishing kind of, you know, first grade at the time. And then where we wanted to target. So we created kind of an action plan over the course of, so there, were, there were two Zoom meetings, so over the course of a couple hours. 
And then we started with writing and then focused on during our sessions, helping develop, you know, taking some of the principles and help and showing mom and really co- like guiding mom to work through with him and then celebrating both of them. So in May, 2020, he was re- composing pig is little. So we're working on the three word utterances And then after a few coaching cycles of, okay, grammar doesn't have to be perfect. We don't need to have all, you know, like every little word in there and embracing some spelling errors because two switch scanning is hard. Um, But through over the course of a little over a year, as you see, that is his writing. Um, We've since burned him out on writing. So now we're back to him dictating to me. But I'll take it. He still is, he's still writing. He's still interested in it as long as we make it a little more fun and less homeworky. Um, so for the brainstorming, he is partner assisted scanning with his grandfather. And then we did the writing in, in a session. And then mom worked on him, worked with him to do grammar. So this was over the course, you know, like it's not in one session that we did all of this. This took the course of probably about three weeks to do. But the writing took about 45 minutes with it. Um, so it can, we can see some pretty impressive and pretty incredible results. So I also want to show you a follow-up video of one uh, so of the same coaches. Or the same, sorry, the same. Yes, yeah. So this is our last meeting. So we've had three or four um, sessions now and we're focusing on evaluation, but we start all of our sessions as a check-in. It's just like learning. And, and you know, it's, it's so funny because I, I did have a lot of like AAC experience and like implementation within the schools. And a lot of it is very similar to like what we are doing like with these like parents and and that mm-hmm. early like emerging language and like how to foster that and how to like create opportunities mm-hmm. and it really is like the same principles and it's just I think me shifting my mindset and and figuring out how to like best coach these parents and and create like a very approachable way to to talk to them about like different strategies and where their child's at and um yeah it's just it's been so exciting just to like learn and to to figure out those um those new things that and how i can implement it but um but yeah it is a little uncomfortable you know walking in and being like i don't know like (laughs) Mm -hmm. i used to know but i don't know and it's okay and um yeah so i'm like so glad that we have this community that we get to like connect with because Mm -hmm. i do really look forward to these types of meetings because i like i i soak in a ton too and i'm like oh that's a great idea i can do it this way um so yeah that's where i'm at Hey. I love that, Emma. Thanks I for sharing that, that with us. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I think I can definitely relate to the the uncomfiness as I'm prepping to do, like, to make my screening, post-screening phone calls or, like, emails for some of those families, Emma, that we know were, like, maybe not feeling super... Or, or like, maybe Jenny, the um, staff member over there, kind of in indicated that they weren't real ready to hear Mm -hmm. kind of like what the screening results might be and um I think especially now I'm trying to be really aware of how I communicate things Mm -hmm. and um I'm like trying to communicate weaknesses in a strengths-based way you know I know it feels uncomfortable but by leaning into that discomfort and uncomfortableness like you know, as I said that's when growth happens and we want to be growing as clinicians and as therapists and it's also really uncomfortable for families mm-hmm. and acknowledging and approaching it you know like Katie from a human like we're all human and have feelings and feelings are complex yeah and Emma you're saying that like remembering things that you used to know. It's funny, Mm -hmm. I had a conversation with one of the AAC reps on Friday. I have to get her to send me the information. She watched a doc, I think it was a documentary or 
And that information is in your resources. It's the knowledge horizon and the Dunning-Kruger effect. Docu-series, something that was about, like, as you become more expert or gain more knowledge and expertise, you're more aware of what you don't know. And then there's this base, so like you're not, as your knowledge base grows, there's also this hole in the middle of what you forgot you don't know. And I'm wondering if that's what you're feeling is, oh, I, I knew this stuff, but I forgot I knew it. And now it has to come back from the archives. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. If you um have, if you can get that name, I always love like. So Shana, we're just doing a check-in and Elizabeth, we're just checking in with how things are going. And before we dive in to other AAC related things. Um, I was going to share that the last meeting that we had, it prompted me to the kiddo that I was asking about where I was saying his family speaks Arabic at home and I'm seeing like some characteristics of autism presenting in the, in the little guy, but you know, Emma and I have talked a lot about this and figuring out, which I think Katie, I was catching the end of that conversation there, um, where to go. But last Friday, I like brought a little key card ring just to like trial some of like um using like those functional words like more and all done and i'm trying to think what and want i think i put in there but we tried like just five words um and it it wasn't like as smooth as it could have gone um but he did like point to tell me to open a box three times um god it was exciting. He threw it across the room a couple of times um but <laughs> he pointed at it a couple of times to so you see there, we are focusing on the client and what they were doing. And like seemed receptive. Um, so that that was like my first experience. He's an early intervention guy Good. and just navigating, um, which was exciting. And like that conversation was very helpful in getting the wheels turning to be like, okay, how can we problem solve here and help pro like progress the growth that we're not quite seeing right now? Mm -hmm. Good. And using it on the first time he sees it is amazing. Yes, I was excited. He only did it with open, but he pointed at it three times. More. Hey, this is what okay. I wanted to say. That other yeah. stuff is not right yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh huh. Sorry, I should have mentioned I also had a cold while we were doing that, which is the D and, the, and some of the facial expressions. So, yeah, so you could see in that interaction, the other SLPs did a, did more talking than I was doing. So I was cheering them on and what I cut off was the, there, my face there was the only of like, <laughs> then there is no only used it. It's they used it and let's celebrate that. And that's amazing. So hopefully from next steps, hopefully if you wanna throw in the chat, have your views of coaching changed and which models you're using. We would love to know in our last minute what you are hoping to implement in the future and if there are any questions. I know I've thrown a lot at you guys today. Anyone want to share what? You know, I, I was so impressed with that last video um, of, of the same group because for me, the, the goal of coaching is to help people figure out their own solutions in the long run and, and basically not need me anymore as, as a coach. So that was such a good demonstration of they could have gone on meeting without you. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully they did. I don't know. <laughs> we then shifted. They do have their own meetings without me. Um, we then shifted into our the, our focus is on evaluations. So working through our current cycle is on evaluation. So building their inf their knowledge base. And I did some demos of different systems. So building their knowledge base of different AAC systems and evaluations. But yes, the problem solving part. Yeah, I didn't have to lead much, which is exactly the goal. Good. Quinn, I'm glad that you got some good some strategies. Um, I do want to 
point out that George Ann Hartley is here today with us. She's our Oregon Department of Education representative, and she's probably brand new to Echo Voices. There you are. I was hoping maybe you'd uh, show us your beautiful face today. Um, she'll be joining us when she can, I'm sure, but I see, George Ann, you've put your email in the chat. Uh, is there anything you want to say before we close today? You know, I, this was fabulous. I, it was a great first first ride, I got to tell you. Um, thank you so much for all that. It was well done. Uh, no, I just, I really don't even know what I'm doing yet. So I'm here <laughs> observing and listening. Thank you for having me. <laughs> okay. And Heidi, I want to say thank you to you. I second George Ann's comments you it was marvelously developed and um I, you know i do personally a lot of work in coaching and i learned a whole bunch today so that's always my definition of a really good session thank you i don't know go ahead um i would welcome anybody else who wants to say anything to uh to join in this conversation. We can stop the recording, um, but we always uh